It's good to see y'all. If you want to open up your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to get right into this, continue our study of this really good book, great book. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we'll start on verse number 10. How about it? Now, we're going to just start with a verse that is just, I mean, I don't know if you can find the, one, the, the verse that is, is just the most common sense, just straight to you. No, no commentary necessary, but this is one of those verses. Chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> now, obviously, he, now just in the, all the, the context is, is wisdom. You know? um, wisdom being better than foolishness or wisdom being superior than, than folly. More common sense. It says, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. All right, well, we get that. That, that's easy to, to figure out, right? Now, the, the the teaching here is somewhat similar to the poor wise man saving the city. You y'all remember talking about that in uh, in chapter? Let's see, chapter nine, verse fourteen. The little city being besieged by a great king, and then the poor wise man saves the city with his wisdom. There, in that illustration, wisdom won out over strength, and so too here. I mean, if you chop wood with a dull axe, that means you're going to have to swing harder to, to chop, right? <laughs> and then you have, you're using more strength, and so you have less strength to work longer, and you, which results in less work being done, and then you know you're prone to injuring yourself. And just sharpen the axe. That's all you gotta do. Just sharpen the axe. Boom. That's wisdom. You see how easy it is to have wisdom in life. I got thinking about this, and uh, I remember when I was young and in school. You have still have pencil sharpeners, right? On the walls. Okay. Just making sure that's not done. I don't know if everybody was using mechanical pencils nowadays or what, but so uh, well, you sharpen your y'all ever sharpen your pencil in the thing, or even the one you, you jam it down in there, and uh, it only like sharpens half of the the lead, and so you have like half lead, half wood. Well, I get up there and I sharpen it, you know. You have to, and you go all the way back to your seat, and you find out that it's just wood, half wood, so. You can only use it so much before the wood. You start writing with the wood. That doesn't work. And so instead of going all the way back up to the pencil sharpener, well, I would just kind of pick the wood around the leg. You, know? you ever do that? Like, man, I don't want to sharpen it again. I'll just pick the wood out. Pick the wood. Pick the wood. And it, took, it takes you forever to do it. And But then you're, you know, as you're writing, it's still, it's not the best. You're, I ought to have just gone up there and just sharpen the thing. Make it right. I was not using wisdom with my pencil right there, right? Just go up there and sharpen the pencil. You're going to write that. But I think this, uh, this little proverb, I guess you could say, is uh, it applies to, I think, any kind of work or anything we seek to accomplish in life, right? Uh, you've heard the idea that, uh, what did I say, you work, uh, you work smarter, not harder kind of thing. Wasn't there a lot of wisdom in that? I mean, we can have the greatest of skill. Someone can be just very skillful at a particular thing, but really that's only going to take a person so far, right? You need to have a little bit of wisdom along with all that skill you've got, and then you're gonna then you're gonna get somewhere. Does that make sense? Right? And that and that applies to everywhere, right? Doesn't it? Every job you hold. So wisdom, Solomon's just saying, hey, wisdom. Yet again, I'm trying to get this in your head here. Wisdom prevails over strength every single time. Any comments on that? No, no, no life examples anyone wants to share? <laughs> That's probably wise. Probably wise not to. 
All right, look at verse 11 here. Okay, now, if you're reading along, okay, so this is the New King James. I have a guy up here on the screen, and I read from the New King James. You might have something different, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different here, but I'm going to point this out. It says, a, a serpent may bite when it is not charmed. The babbler is no different. That's the New King James. It says the babbler is no different. Uh, the King James reads a little similar to that. But if you have like an American standard or a new American standard, those two read similar. And here's what that, that says. It says, if the, serpent, if the serpent bites before it is charmed, then, then is there no advantage in the charmer? Uh, King, King James or New King James talking about a babbler. And then the other, these other two are talking about a charmer. And just in case you did, if you didn't know, so the King James is translated from something called the Texas Receptus. It's a, it's a different manuscript than what the American Standard was translated from, which is called the Westcott Horton text. And so sometimes the Texas Receptus, the TR, uh, is a little different than the Westcott Court text, and that's why you have the different translations, especially between King James and, and American Standard, and, and things like uh, the NIV, I think, does a lot of uh, Westcott Court, and uh, the uh, English Standard Version, you might see that, that's uh, usually Westcott Court. The Septuagint, that sometimes I'll, I'll bring out, and, and Bud will bring out, um, the, uh, the, 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 the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, that's, that's, the, that's the Septuagint. You see it LXX, sometimes 70. Uh, that actually agrees with the American standard about the, uh, there's no advantage in the charmer. So it's actually quite different than the King James, the Septuagint. So I'm bringing all this up. Let me just say this. So I want to make sure y'all understand this, that this is not really, this is not a, I don't believe that this is a big issue, that sometimes you see some things that are, are off in these, these dip, from the these different manuscripts. I don't believe the differences that we come across in scriptures, and really you're going to see a lot, I think, in the Old Testament, especially Proverbs does it. Obviously, you know, Ecclesiastes has some as well, maybe even in the Psalms. Mainly it's going to be in the Old Testament where you're going to see these differences. And we might think, oh, this is supposed to be the word of God. Why are all these differences? These kinds of differences here, they do no, I'd say no, none of the differences in the text, do no harm to the integrity of the scriptures. And I, I want us to be, to, be, to be clear on that. I don't want this to be casting any kind of doubt on whether we can trust the Bible, uh, what it says or not. These differences that we might find, they do not contradict any other passages of Scripture that you see in the Bible. And let's say you only had an ASB, for example, and you read something, well, that's different than the, the King James. You take that particular verse, as different as it might be from another translation in the same verse, right? As it stands alone, it makes sense. It's not confusing. It's not, well, what in the world does that mean? It's, it makes sense. Not confusing. These differences also, and this is important, they do not undermine or they do not alter the redemption, plan of redemption that is found throughout the Bible. It does not do harm to the, the whole theme of the Bible, which is really the redemption of mankind. There's no, there's no theological you know, differences being, being made when you have a, a, a different worded translation. So we can, so just because we have these in here, it doesn't mean it's not from God. And these differences, from a scholarly standpoint, and of course I'm not one of those, <laughs> but the, the differences, the minor differences that you find in the different manuscripts and whatnot uh, that have been found, they are far, far from being enough to build this case against the reliability of the scriptures. And I just thought it was a good point right here because these verses are so different. I just wanted to point that out and bring that up. All right, now back to the, that, back to the verse. 
So he's talking about charming snakes, right? First time I ever saw that, I think, uh, I don't know, it was on some movie. It might have been. You know, I have a lot of memories from uh, Indiana Jones movies for some reason. But it might, it might have been the first time I saw these tr snake charming stuff was on one of those movies. But uh, so this is a this is a real this is a thing that they do um, that people do and have done for a long time. You actually see some reference to it in some verses here, and I might have them on screen. Yeah. So there's one in Jeremiah, but I'm going to read one from uh, the book of Psalms. That's Psalms 58. So you can know that this was a very this is a familiar practice. This this uh, charming the snakes kind of stuff. So Psalm 58. It says in verse 4, he's talking about the wicked, the wicked people. He says, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops its ear, which will not heed the voice of charmers, charming ever so skillfully. Okay, so that's so that's the thing. That was This was a known practice, um, and Jeremiah talks about it too. But, so the, the charmer of snakes, what is his main job to do? Yeah, he's supposed to charm, right? He keeps the snake's attention, right? And so if he fails to do that, then what's going to happen? <coughs> Likely what's going to happen. If he doesn't keep that snake's attention, he doesn't charm the snake. You're going to get bit. Yep, you're going to get bit. And they didn't do this. Well, I understand. They didn't do this with little grass snakes, you know, little, little harmless snakes. These are, they usually did it with very poisonous ones. And so... Uh, it gets out of control, whatever the charming gets out of control, and uh, you get bit by the poisonous snake, and the venom spreads into the blood, and then, you know, death is probably going to happen. So it's pretty important that this charmer does his job of charming, right? And I think what, what he is, what the point of this is, is that wisdom is good, wisdom is great, it is great. But it needs to be applied in the right situations, and it needs to be applied at, in a, let's say, in a timely manner before it is too late, right? Because there could be, a, let's say, in this room, we get, there's a problem. Ton of wisdom in this room, but if nobody says anything, then their problem is just going to get to, maybe get to a point where, oops, can't do anything about it now, Right? Does that make sense? Wisdom needs to be applied in a, in a timely manner and in the right situations. That's the point of talking about the snake charmer there. The snake being charmed. What do you think? You good with that? Did I convince you? Okay. <laughs> all right, now the thought, this is really, all of this is one big thought. It's not jumping from subject to subject to subject. I'm trying to do my best to show that that's the case. All right, so verse 11 ends about, uh, really about a thought about words, uh, about the charmer uh, doing his job. But, uh, but then verse 12, it keeps going. That's why maybe the, uh, the New King James uses the word babbler. Because uh, it's, it's on the thought about words. Now, verse 12, though, keeps it going. He says, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool, his, his words, shall swallow him up. All right, now his words being gracious, what's another word you, you can say? What's another word for that? Someone who is gracious is kind? Okay, yeah, kind. So his words being kind and gracious, this is presenting the idea that his words, this man's words, the words of a wise man, brings him favor, brings him favor. So these words of his, they do something very good, specifically for him, in contrast to the lips or the words of a fool, which bring him no favor, and they, they are doing bad things. If we were to go over to Proverbs 3, verse 4, this same word for gracious there is translated favor. And it says, and so find favor... Same word, or we might would say grace there, in high esteem in the sight of God and, and man. Proverbs 22 and verse 11, I don't think I have that one up there. 
Proverbs 22 and verse 11 talks about a, a, a man or a person who has grace on his lips. That's the same idea here. He's got grace on his lips. Well, he's going to uh, be a friend. The king is going to be his friend. If he has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. In other words, he's going to find favor because of his wise words. But the fool here, in contrast, the fool is swallowed up. He is devoured, so to speak. He's consumed. He's destroyed by his own words. And we know people have, I mean, you know, I would imagine that people do that all, all the time. They just talk, 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 and eventually, you know, they, they end up, you know, figuratively swallowing themselves up. The idea is really, and it's, I don't mean this to be like morbid or gross or anything, but it's like a self the idea being presented is like self-cannibalism. <laughs> uh, and that's how awful a fool's words can be to his own self. We can go back to chapter 4 in this book, Ecclesiastes, in verse number 5. The fool is, is talked about, it, uh, he is consumed because of a different, something different that he does. There he says, it says, uh, a fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Well, there he's talking about being lazy, basically, that he does nothing. So the idea there in chapter 4 and verse 5, the fool is rotting away, so to speak. He's, he's devouring himself because he does nothing. He says he does nothing. Here, oh, at least the fool is doing something, but it's all the wrong things with his words. He's devoured. He is, he's consumed. He's destroyed by the foolish things that come from his lips. All right, verse 13 it says, The words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is raving madness. So it doesn't get any better. Once it starts, it's already foolishness, and we you can tell. I mean, don't, don't name names, but have you ever heard someone, as soon as they start talking, like, oh, boy, this is not going to go good. <laughs> uh, I have. Their words get worse and worse and worse. It's almost as if we're like praying as they talk. We're praying that things will get better. Maybe they'll, but it doesn't. Worse and worse and worse, and uh, till the till the bitter till the bitter bitter end. And raving madness is, yeah, I don't know. We don't quite talk like that, but uh, we get that. Have you ever seen people raving mad? Before, <laughs> verse fourteen says, "A fool also multiplies words." Or you might see there he's full of words. He multiplies words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? Back in chapter three. Ecclesiastes in verse 7, it talks about a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that, right? In verse 7, it talks about there being a time to keep silence. Sometimes there's a time to speak. And sometimes there's a time to just whoop, zip it. But the foolish person does not quite understand that time to be quiet. They got the time to speak down pat. They got that. They know that time, but they don't know the time to be silent. Now, the Hebrew word for fool here in verse 14, that a fool also multiplies words, that's a different Hebrew word from verse number 12 that talks about a fool there as well. The lips of a fool, different word than verse 14, a fool. A different word. So in verse 14, the one we just read, it has the idea that he's, this is a, a very dense and confused thinker. Like he's, he's talking, but he doesn't quite really know what he's even talking about. In verse 12, same English word fool, but the Hebrew word means more like a person with unwarranted self-confidence. 
Like they are so proud of themselves, but they have no reason to be at all whatsoever. It's kind of the same thing. So, so what, what do we have? We got the Hebrew using two different words to describe the same thing. Don't we do that all the time? Don't we have those things? So let's say if I call someone a, if I call, which I would never do. If I call someone a bonehead, and then I call them a goofball. Well, that's pretty much the same thing, right? I mean, pretty much. Then that would be using two different words to describe the same fool. So it should. So so that's not weird that the Hebrews, the Hebrew language, does that. So we're really going from verse twelve and thirteen and fourteen. We we're getting this this picture of a person who is a foolish boaster, just talking, and really it's about it's about him, not himself. He's boasting about himself, and he's boasting about his accomplishments and his future achievements. Watch what look how good I am, and I'm going to do this. You just wait and see. I'm going to do this and this and this. And that's why he says in verse 14, he says, no man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will come after him? How does he know that he's going to do all of these wonderful, great things? This guy's a fool. So Solomon corrects that. That kind of talk that comes from a fool, this foolish boasting, by saying again, he said this before in, the, in this particular book, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. No man can know that. You don't know. You don't know what uh, what tomorrow holds. How can you boast like that? Doesn't James? Y'all remember James saying something about that in the New Testament? I'm talking about. Oh, we're going to do this tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> well, James does. If you don't remember, James does. I'll remind you. James chapter four. And starting at verse 13, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read 13 through 16, James 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Well, that's great. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, verse 15 says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Now watch what in verse 16. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. This is the boasting and arrogance from this fool in, in chapter 10. Boasting in his, his arrogance. Fools look foolish by their foolish words, right? <laughs> that's what basically, that's, what he's, that's the point he's getting. Fools look foolish by their foolish words. You can spot them a mile away. Spot them a mile away. And it's almost as if he's pleading with us, don't, don't be, don't be, don't do this. Don't do this. More thought. Think more. Talk less. Because that's what wise people do. Right? Again, I think that applies, I mean, unless you have a job where you got to do a lot of talking, but even then you can, you can do more thinking and less talking. You just make sure your words are the words that people need to hear. Kind of thing. They're the wise ones. The wise words, you don't, you don't have to talk so much. What do y'all think? Any, any comments or questions? I mean, this is pretty, I mean, it's simple, right? I mean, this is this is a lot of common sense. It, it's not like the first time we've talked about fools and their foolish ways uh, before. In this book of Ecclesiastes, when we went through Proverbs, we talked a lot about foolishness, didn't we? Y'all might remember that. I passed out those sheets with all those verses on it and foolishness that had a lot of verses on it, right? You remember? A lot of them. Filled the whole page up on them. All right, you guys are just soaking it in like little sponges. This is wonderful. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say we have two ears and one mouth. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that somewhere before. You got two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? 
God knew what he was doing, maybe. <laughs> when he baked. All right, verse number 15. Did we go there? All right. It says, The labor of fools wearies them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. All right, so this fool, well, he can talk about all the future all he wants to. The future, he has no idea what's going on. He doesn't really even know what he's talking about. Boasting on himself. And so then when he actually, he says, well, what, what, what should we do to all of these great things? And then when he tries to do these great things, he fails and fails and fails and fails miserably because he's going about it in a foolish way. The work that he actually does do is fruitless. There's no future there. There's no future there. His work wearies him. Fools are usually the ones that quit when things get tough. Quit. Instead of pursuing. Now the last half, I think, is similar to verse number three. So verse number three, it says, even when the fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom. We talked about, well, that's a little bit of an over-exaggeration, but he's trying to make the point that they can't even go out in public. They can't even walk down the sidewalk kind of thing. That's how foolish they are. Now this one, uh, they, don't, they don't even know how to go into the city. We went to someone's house Friday night. Never been there before. They gave us all these directions, and it was turn, turn this way, this way. We got there all right, but I was more definitely more prone to getting lost going to that place than I would be staying on the main road all the way to like Johnson City, let's say. That's easy. It's just like one road. You just go all the way in there. The way to the city in any place, that's going to be the easiest road to follow, That right? That's going to be probably the biggest, the widest. Most people are going to be on it. It's going to be well marked, right? That's the easiest road to follow. But he says here, they don't even know how to go to the city. And he's just, he's just really emphasizing the fact that, yeah, the ignorance of the fool is way on up there. He's teaching us how to spot a fool, even within our own selves. Poor guy, you almost feel sorry for him. You don't even know how to go down the, the straight road. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like, he thinks, like, well, that, that, that he knows better than everybody kind of deal. Yeah, you would think it, ha it has to be pride and, 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 and arrogance are involved in this, right? Into the fool. I mean, uh, us men, you know, we, I mean, we ask for directions all the time, right? Uh, what? No, you don't. <laughs> so we might have a little foolishness in us. We're like, well, I know I, I can figure this out. Don't worry, honey. I know where I'm going. <laughs> but this is to the nth degree, right? Okay, verse 16. He says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. And your princess feast in the morning. Okay, so children do not, uh, you would agree that children do not know how to be a king, just generally speaking. I mean, I guess, even like, you know, you got some child prodigies out there that are just off the wall geniuses, eight years old or whatever. I don't think even they could possibly understand how to be a king. How to be a king? You think? So no, children don't, they don't know how to be a king. They don't know how to rule. And this is, here's what, here's the point. That's obvious. But his point is that men who behave like children do not know how to be a king. They do not know how to rule. That's the point. Now, 
there didn't Judah have a child king at one point, the kingdom of Judah? Didn't they have a child king at one point? Yes. All right. And do y'all remember his name? Josiah. Okay, Josiah. You know how old he was? Let's keep this going. You know how old he was when he started ruling? Twelve. He was what? Twelve or eight. Okay, he started doing things at 12 years old. He was 8 years old when he started ruling. Okay. And I think it was, uh, well, let's say he was 8 years old when he started ruling. I think it was 16, the text says, that he started to seek out the Lord. 20 years old, he didn't, it wasn't until 20 years old. So, yeah, he's sitting on the king, uh, sitting on the throne at, at age 8. But it, the text doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it mentions that it wasn't until he was 20 that he started actually enacting these reforms and changing and getting the nation back to where the kingdom back to where it, it should be. Boy, he was still young, but he wasn't a child. Then. Solomon's own son. Now, who ruled after Solomon? That was his son, the man who was his son. What was his name? Huh? Because he was Jeroboam or Rehoboam. Okay, it's Rehoboam. Rehoboam was his son, Solomon's son. Um, when he was king, he is described as being young, inexperienced, and the word means timid or weak, and he was not able to withstand his own enemies. That's Rehoboam. You know how old he was when he began to rule? 41. 41. The text calls him young, inexperienced, not able to, not able to stand up for himself, basically. 41 years old. Woe to you, O man, when your child, when your king is a child. That's to me that it has Rehoboam and Jeroboam written all over it. The decisions that Rehoboam would make would show that, yeah, he was extremely immature and he was very foolish. He did not know how to rule. And the kingdom suffered greatly for it. The kingdom suffered split, actually, and then it didn't get any really better than that under Rehoboam's rule. Now, this holds true. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. This holds true for anyone in any kind of authority position with people under them in, in whatever thing it might be. For any man, really. We could we might could say, Woe to you, O church, when your preacher or your elder is a, elders are children. Now would that be true? Obviously, we understand you're not going to put children in those positions, but we're talking about when they behave like children. Woe to you, O family. When the father is a child. True? Woe to you, O oh marriage, when your husband is not what he should be. Now, this prince's feasting in the morning kind of thing. What do you think that's talking about? What's wrong with eating breakfast? I don't think they went to bed. Huh? I don't think they went to bed. You don't think they went to bed? Yeah. Are you saying that when the princes are a bunch of party animals? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that's kind of, yeah. I think that's what it's talking about here is when, when they wake up in the morning, they're still drinking and partying and carrying on and having a good time, still attending to business. Yeah. When you got that kind of authority in your government, then you're in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Now, just to, real quick, the princes. These are any kind of rulers. So these are not necessarily the king's sons. We always think prince is the king's son or the queen's son or something like that. These are just any kind of ruler, any kind of a person of any rank or class that would be in a position of, of authority. So yeah, this could be that yeah, they're a bunch of they're just they don't care they don't they don't take their job as their authority position they don't take it seriously at all and they're party animals <laughs> basically that's how we would describe it today they and even if they do go to sleep 
The first thing they do in the morning is not tend to their responsibilities, not tend to the, their duties as a prince or a ruler or whatever it might be. No, let's go, hey, let's have a feast. Let's enjoy life. Let's get drunk, that kind of thing. One person put, one commentator put it like this. He says, this speaks of beginning the day with sensual enjoyment instead of such honest work as attending to state matters, administering justice, etc., as becomes good rulers. So if you have a king who's a child, or he's, let's just say he, he, he is very lax in carrying out his kingly responsibilities, and he doesn't take him seriously at all, then those below him, princes, are going to just follow suit pretty much, right? Well, if the king, king doesn't care what we do, let's just live it up. King's doing it, we'll do it. We answer to him. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. You waking up for the wrong reasons and you start your day out very, very wrongly. Jeremiah 21 and verse 12, O house of David, thus says the Lord, execute judgment in the morning. Not literally, but the you need to have your priorities in order. That's what he's saying. The rulers need to have priorities in order. You got to take care of God's work first. And so Solomon here, he's pronouncing this woe on the land, this woe on the nation. If these two things are the case. Because the Lord's work is not taking priority. The Lord's work is not being done. And that is going to lead to a big, big trouble. And in Solomon's case, in Solomon's own reign, it did exactly that. I'm sure there were a lot of highlights in Solomon's rule. Mainly had to do with money. And they got the temple built. Well, I mean, that's great. But what about the future? Solomon didn't really do a good job with that part, did he? All right, let's get one more verse here. Verse 17. Blessed are you, O land. Now you see the opposite here. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. All right, so, you know... Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a universal truth that uh, for a, a, a man to be a good king, he has to come from nobility. That he has to have some kind of kingly upbringing. And that's the only way a man's going to be a good king. I don't think that's a universal truth. We don't want to be pressing these points too far into things. I think the point here is that if a man that um, does have this kind of upbringing then he is going to have received the proper training. And then, again, that's not universal, but he's going to have received the proper training. He's going to have the support that's needed to actually rule a kingdom in a godly way, in a righteous way. I mean, doesn't that make sense? Not We're not, we're not saying that's a universal rule again because Rehoboam raised up as the king's son, and what did he do? He just threw the kingdom away, basically. But doesn't it make sense that if someone is raised up in that in that environment, that they're probably going to be the ones that you want doing that kind of job? I mean, don't you vote that way? Kind of like, doesn't experience mean something to you guys when you vote? I don't know. I would imagine it does. Like, all right, well, this person seems to know what they're doing because they got a little experience in, in some of this, the thing that they're running for. So, yeah, you know, they might be the one that's going to make good decisions and lead us in the right direction. So that makes sense, right? I might get a lot of blank stares. Does that make sense or am I just going off the rails here? Good to great, and they did a study all the way back of leaders, and 
basically what the study found was, you know, good leaders do things like you said, Solomon, you built the temple. That's yeah, good for you. Everybody was rich. What was it? Stones were like, or money was like stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so everybody's like, ooh, we're doing great. Um, but great leaders do it. Um, first of all, you didn't know who they were. You didn't know their name. Mm. Uh, because they weren't self-aggrandizing. And they made sure that when they left, whatever it was they were leaving, there were at least one or more people who were ready to step in and continue to work in the prosperity industry. Right, okay, yeah. Obviously, Solomon did not do. Right, yeah. And a lot, he, he, he knows, I think Solomon knew better. And I'm going to mention this later next time we meet, but... Uh, Solomon had the wisdom to do everything. He knew what he could do. He just didn't do it. But God gave him gave him all the wisdom that he needed, but it was up to Solomon to put it into application, and he, he failed to do that a number of times. Okay, we'll stop there. Might say a little more about that verse, and then uh, continue on into the rest of the chapter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.